name is uh, Joan Reed, Dr. Joan Reed. I am Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School and want to welcome you to this part of our series on equity and social justice, uh, completely organized by all the landers here. Uh, and this is really born out of the work of a committee that we have at the medical school that has students, faculty, staff uh, coming together, uh, talking about equity and social justice, and really looking at it in four lenses, looking at it in terms of history and context, so that we understand how we got to where we are, culture and environment, health disparities, and another component that really is looking at leadership and leadership skills um, so that we can better address issues that relate to equity and social justice. Um, our speakers today, Alden Landry is going to present. One of them has come back to us. He was here uh, last year for another program and um, was exciting uh, to have him. Um, so I'm so glad he's joined us again. Uh, Dr. Landry uh, holds many titles, and some of you may know at Harvard Medical School, you may not get money, <laughs> and you may not get fame, but you get lots of titles. <laughs> so he is an assistant professor in emergency medicine. He is one of the leaders um, here in the medical school uh, in the, is it the Cannon Society? The Cannon Society. Yes. Castle Society, and he's also one of the faculty advisors in my Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership. But more importantly, he's also an innovator, and some of you may have heard of the Tour for Diversity and some of the other work and programs that he's started, uh, and particularly some of the programs that are around men of color uh, in the academy. And with that, Dr. Alden Landry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I won't make you do the, uh, uh, the, the rebuttal that Dr. Reed often makes you do, since you've already done it. I know everybody's awake. Um, I am very pleased to be um, uh, organizing this and moderating these um, sessions, especially this one, because I think it's something that's very pertinent to all of us in our experiences in health and in healthcare. Um, they say uh, all politics are local, well, all racism is personal. Um, and uh, one of the stories that I just wanted to share with you as we jump into this and I introduce our speaker is one of the experiences I had when I was sort of coming into this world of understanding about race, racism, and, and, and medicine. And it was a story that I had um, when I was interacting with a patient in the emergency department. And it was a gentleman who was in the emergency department and, you know, it was a busy day in the ED. And as an emergency physician, we were trying to take care of as many patients as possible and the gentleman was put in the, the hallway because that was the only place we had available at that time for him to receive care. He had a very simple condition, something that was going to easily be managed uh, with antibiotics and an admission to the hospital. But unfortunately, because we just had such limited space, there was no other place to put him. Uh, so he was in the hallway, and unfortunately, because the hospital was busy and we weren't able to get patients moved out of the emergency department onto the floors, um, this gentleman was there probably for the entirety of my shift in the emergency department. And so over the course of the shift, I made uh, acquaintances with him. We had conversations, not just about his medical condition, but whatever else may be going on. So we talked about sports, we talked about um, whatever, uh, whatever else may be going on as I would have to pass him in the hallway because, again, he was in a very busy part of the emergency department. And it was coming towards the end of my shift when I was uh, finishing up and uh, I was going to be signing out and leaving um, that I walked over to him and I said, excuse me, sir, is there anything else I can do for you? I'm going to be leaving. Um, where you've gotten your antibiotics. Your bed's going to be available soon. You're going to be going upstairs. And uh, he said, no. And he said, thank you for your care. And I, and I said, uh, I, know, I hope you get better. And as I was about to walk away, he, 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 he said, hey, doc. And I said, yes, sir. And I turned around. And I was thinking he was going to ask for something simple, whether it's you know, a sandwich or another blanket or anything to make his, his stay a little bit more comfortable in the emergency department. And he looked at me and he said, I just have one question for you. I said, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And he said, why do all the black patients get put in the hallway? And I stopped because I wasn't expecting that question. And I, and I, I froze for a second. And then I quickly looked around the emergency department and I looked and he was right. There was a larger proportion of minority patients in the, in the hallway compared to what we had in the rooms. And I stopped and I had to think, well, what is going on with this? And that was sort of my, my first real entree into what's happening in our healthcare system, what's happening in healthcare, when a patient brought it to my attention. And of course, one of the things I did was I brought this up to my faculty, my, my leadership in my hospital, my chair, 
And they were like, no, 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 no. We would never do that, never do that, never do that. Uh, there was a whole lot of no's. And I said, well, let's look at it. You know, we're academicians. We like studies. We like numbers. We like data. Let's look at it. And so I work with the statistician, and I work with the, um, uh, some of the folks in the operations in the department. And as we started to crunch the numbers, we unfortunately saw that our patient was right. Um, he was more right when it comes to lower acuity patients, and he was definitely more right when it comes to how we treated our homeless patients. Um, but he um, was a little bit incorrect. In our higher acuity patients, we did see some parity. Um, but I just say that to say that uh, our patients recognize what's going on and how they feel when they are being treated in the hospital, how they feel when they're being treated in the acute care setting or in the, in the pra um, private practice, um, has an impact on their care. Um, as we go through our discussions today with both our panelists uh, and our keynote, I think we're going to start to hear some of those themes start to come out um, in our discussions. So with that, I want to introduce uh, our keynote speaker first, uh, and then after uh, he speaks, we'll have a brief minute uh, for Q&A, and then following that, we're going to bring up our panelists, and we'll uh, introduce those panelists, and, and then we'll jump into a, what I hope is going to be a really robust discussion with you all, where you all get to participate and uh, ask uh, some high-quality questions and really start to get some information going and trade some ideas and talk more about solutions. We know racism exists. We know what's going on in the climate of our country, but how can we start to address some of these issues? So very briefly, um, if you look in your, um, uh, uh, in your handouts, you have uh, uh, Rasan Hall's um, bio. So I, I want to go through it very briefly and just give you a couple key highlight highlights. So Rasan Hall is the Director of Racial Justice Program for the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. In this role, Rasan helps to develop the agency's integrated advocacy approach to address racial justice issues. Uh, through legislative uh, advocacy, litigation, community engagement, the program works on issues that deeply impact communities of color and historically disenfranchised communities. Prior to his uh, joining the ACLU, uh, uh, Rassam was the deputy director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice, where his work included policy and legislative active, uh, advocacy, community outreach, and maintaining litigation caseload for voting rights, police misconduct, misconduct and public accommodation cases. Uh, in addition to leading the ACLU uh, racial justice program, he also serves on the Massachusetts Legal Assistant Corporation Board of Directors, the Hymas Foundation's Board of Trustees, and former co-chair of the Boston Bar Association Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Section. He also is a member of the Massachusetts uh, IOLTA Committee. Uh, Rasan is, admit, uh, is admitted to practice uh, in Massachusetts and in the United States District Court uh, for the District of Massachusetts. He is a graduate of the Ohio State University, <laughs> Northeastern University School of Law and Andover Newton Theological School. Uh, he is an ordained reverend uh, in the uh, African uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. With that, please welcome uh, Attorney Rasan Hall. Thank you. Okay, is this on? All right, good. Thank you, Dr. Landry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I apologize, I was a little late uh, in my arrival. And um, part of the reason I was late is because what I do for work. Um, what's up, man? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm drawing attention to folks. Um, uh, part of what I do for work is uh, legislative advocacy, and there is a major criminal law reform bill that is moving through the Massachusetts legislature right now. And, uh, yeah, and so it's important that we try to get this passed, and that's what I've been doing, uh, spending a lot of my time on, and uh, amendments are due today. So I'm sitting there trying to go through amendments to figure out as much as I can uh, about these amendments that will be filed for a bill that will be voted on on um, next Wednesday. Uh, but it's interesting that I'm here today having this conversation because this is related uh, to, to the advocacy that I'm doing. And, and, and part of the way it's interesting how things come full circle. Early on when we started doing uh, criminal law reform advocacy for this legislative session, uh, there was a report that was filed by Mass Inc. Uh, that looked at the geography of incarceration. And one of the things that the legislators said during one of the hearings was, uh, 
you know, it would be really good to have some health data uh, about the, or the health impacts of, of incarceration. So we can see that there are large numbers of people that are living in certain communities uh, that are overrepresented in the criminal justice system or the criminal legal system. Uh, there's a question as to whether or not there's justice there. Uh, but what are the health implications? And so I did what any wise person would do who doesn't know something about a particular area, and that's go to the expert. So I uh, emailed Dr. Nancy Krieger and asked, um, you know, do you have any information on the health impacts of incarceration? And within hours, I had my inbox flooded with articles. Uh, and it is because of uh, that request uh, and response to that request that I'm able to talk to you all today in a way that I think might be uh, relevant. I'm, I'm not a public health uh, expert, uh, not in medicine, uh, but what I feel my role is is to glean from the experts what they do, what they talk about, and see how it applies uh, to the advocacy uh, that is being done and, and touches on what I'm doing. So here are some statistics on some disparities that you probably can't see too well, so I'm just going to lift up uh, a couple of them. When you look at it, these are national statistics, I believe this is from 2014, uh, median household assets, uh, white families are about 110,000, Asian families 89,000, Latinx uh, 7,600, black families uh, 6,300. Uh, when you look at Boston, the Boston Federal Reserve Bank did a study uh, maybe two or three years ago, uh, the color of wealth, and that number for black Bostonians was $8. Look at childhood poverty, 10% uh, of white uh, children are living in poverty, 12% Asian, 23% Latinx, 26 black, 28% Native American. Uh, incarceration rates per 100,000, 610 white, 185 Asian, Latinx, 836 black, 3,611. Those are some pretty alarming uh, disparities. There's also disparities in rates of diabetes uh, and infant mortality. Uh, but you know, what does that mean, right? It could just mean that black people eat worse food and are going to have worse health outcomes, uh, or that black and native folks are just lazy and that's why they earn less. I think it's important to not be drawn into that narrative and think about another system that is an operation and that is uh, structural racism. And in this definition, and folks at the Aspen Institute use this uh, in the U.S., uh, structural racism, and norm it's the normalization and legitimization uh, of an array of dynamic historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal uh, that routinely advantage whites while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. It is a system of hierarchy and inequity, primarily characterized by uh, white supremacy, the preferential treatment, privilege, and power for white people at the expense of black, Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American, Arab, or other racially oppressed people. And so this conversation, you know, looking, reaping what we sow, looking at structural racism as the drivers of health inequities, um, how do, or health disparities, how, what is the structure uh, that is doing that here? And in this instance, I'm looking at the criminal legal system and how people are incarcerated. But before we delve much deeper into that, it's important to have a context. And for me, in the advocacy work that I do, this is the context. The taking of this land from First Nation people. This is the context of where we are, uh, or from whence we have come. This is the context. This is the forced migration of African people from the continent of Africa. And you know, I get it. The initial reaction is like, but that was so long ago. What does that have to do with anything now? My people never owned slaves. You yourself were never a slave. None of your immediate relatives. Uh, were ever slaves. How uh, does that directly impact you? Uh, 
there are a whole lot of ways that it can impact us. And I, I like to think because I live in an echo chamber or in a bubble and have conversations with a lot of people who view the world the same way I do, uh, is that we understand how there is a connection uh, to these historical uh, antecedents. Uh, but I think it's important to look at the, the thread that runs through slavery and genocide to where we are uh, today. The end of the Civil War, slavery ends. Here's something that's interesting, though. If you haven't seen already, I encourage you uh, to watch the Netflix documentary, The 13th, by Ava DuVernay. Uh, it's, it's very compelling. It tells a very good story. Uh, but this language of the 13th Amendment, which uh, outlaws slavery in America, leaves this one little provision. And it's interesting that this is the provision that is left, except as punishment for crime. So no one can be forced into labor. No one can be uh, made to work uh, except for punishment for a crime. Keep that in your mind. And we think about the Reconstruction era, the rebuilding of the South, the creation of or the beginning of the creation of wealth in black communities, the appointment to positions as judges, as legislators in the South, but just as the pendulum swung one way, it immediately swung back uh, the other way. And these are some very interesting black codes, because as black folks got a little more freedom, and got a little more power, got a little more control over their life, uh, and had more agency, white folks in the South immediately pushed back. Right? Once the federal troops were removed, uh, at the end of the Reconstruction period, you see the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. You see the rise of violence against black communities, and you see the rise of black codes, laws that criminalize black conduct, black behavior, and black bodies. And it is in these codes that uh, black folks are criminalized and make up the labor force that was just decimated um, from the uh, elimination of slavery. Uh, folks can talk about um, sharecropping as a, a model for maintaining these plantations, uh, but the profit margin is a little bit different when you're sharecropping versus when you have free labor. And so if you can be uh, arrested uh, for being drunk in the parish uh, and being locked away, that then becomes the labor force. It's interesting to note that uh, one of the largest plantations in the state of Louisiana uh, was Angola Plantation, which is now a prison. And there is that thread. So when people say, yes, yeah, slavery was so long ago, but we're seeing it right here uh, and right now. Um, so different provisions of where people can go, who they can live with, vagrancy laws, um, anti-miscegenation laws. These were the things that would result in people becoming incarcerated uh, and becoming the labor force uh, for slavery. The Convict Leasing is a great book by Douglas Blackman, Slavery by Another Name, that also delves into this in a little more detail. Uh, and, you know, this is a labor camp. Um, they're wearing those uh, prison fatigues, but, you know, how is that any different than a chain gang for a, a group of enslaved people? And immediately on the heels, uh, or existing at the same time, is Jim Crow, right? And it, I, you could arguably say that it becomes official uh, with this decision, the Plessy v. Ferguson decision in 1896. Homer Pless, Plessy, um, uh, the, the term used at the time was a mulatto black or a mixed race uh, black, but you know we live under the one drop rule, so we quadroon, octoroon, those were the terms that were used to determine how many uh, generations back black folks were uh, in your bloodline. Uh, he was someone that was considered a mixed race person and wanted to challenge uh, the state's separate car law. And it was through this lawsuit that that happened um, this says something about what black folks have been doing in this country. We haven't just been always going along uh, with this. We have been resisting and we have been fighting uh, this. But through this lawsuit where he challenges the state's separate, uh, uh, separate car law, uh, he lost. <laughs> and we lost. Uh, 
because the Supreme Court then determined that, hey, there's another car for y'all, and although it is separate, it is equal. So this law does not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And so from that, we have a whole series of um, uh, regimes that exist under Jim Crow from segregated housing. We have restrictive covenants that you cannot deed land to anyone other than persons from a certain race. Or um, the Federal Housing Administration back in the 30s came out with redlined maps where you know, a mortgage were uh, either granted or denied based on where a home was. And if it was in the red part uh, of the map, which was usually designated by where black people were living, the mortgages would be denied or the insurance rates would be uh, that much higher or block busting where people would convince folks to sell their houses at cheaper for the, because of the threat uh, of black folks moving into the community or steering where you're driving all of the black people uh, or Latino people into a particular community uh, driving down the rates of that community's uh, housing value uh, and concentrating uh, the substandard housing and fewer resources that are available um, and less equity in people's homes. And understanding generationally that that's how oftentimes wealth is transferred through, uh, through home equity. You know, voter disenfranchisement. I mean, I, I don't know that we need to uh, relitigate. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, I, I see, you know, people celebrating the suffragist movement and saying, you know, 100 years that women have been able to vote, but then the comment is not all women, right? Because black women did not have the right to vote unilaterally throughout this country. Uh, segregated medical facilities. Uh, my father found this old picture of this hospital that he used to visit uh, his mother in when he was 18 and she was on her deathbed. Uh, and he just thought that that was the hospital that was closest to them when in reality there were other hospitals there, but that was the hospital uh, for black folks because he grew up in the segregated South. Uh, employment and education. And again, these are all a part of the context, this thread uh, that runs from slavery through today because when we're looking at the health conditions of a particular community, you have to take into account uh, education. You have to take into account wealth. You have to take into account uh, the surrounding conditions of the community. And uh, I'm oftentimes stunned when people just kind of look at communities of color, particularly black and Latino communities where there are high concentrations of poverty and high concentrations of underperforming schools and high concentrations of crime or higher levels of crime and somehow suspect that it is because of the people who live there that the community looks like that as opposed to it being a function of societal structures, uh, greater instances of discrimination, uh, societal discrimination as well as individual acts uh, of discrimination, all acting in concert together uh, to create this cauldron uh, of poverty and depression. It's not like they just got like this just because, or again, just because folks are lazy and don't want any better for themselves, but there are systems that are in operation working against them to oppress and to deny. And then there's Jim's uncle, uh, Sam, and um, <laughs> You know, these are the ways in which the federal government has been involved in uh, denying resources and access and opportunity uh, to people from communities of color. The Social Security uh, Act of 1935, there was a particular um, arrangement that was made so that Southern Democrats could get on board with it uh, that would deny uh, Social Security to domestics and agricultural workers. Well, who was that in the 30s in the South? That was black folks. So in addition to um, having to take care of an older adult in the family, you know, younger family members would be responsible for taking care of their parents. Uh, it would also limit the type of resources that were available to be passed on generationally, the GI Bill. This was a great source for soldiers returning home uh, to take that money and to um, buy a first home. Disproportionately black soldiers were denied uh, access to GI Bill funds. Uh, the Federal Housing Administration, again, this was a, f a specific function of their work was to draw these redlined maps. 
the Federal Highway Act, funds given to communities to build highways, but in essence what would happen is entire swaths of community would be raised uh, so that a highway could go because as white flight happened, white folks needed to get back in the city to work. So what was the best way to do that? And it's just a straight line with the highway, right? And you look where the uh, orange line is now in the city of Boston, um, that was supposed to be a highway that was running through here to get out to the suburbs because white flight had happened. Folks need to get back in to get their jobs, but because of the resistance and activism uh, of people in this city, it, it's now an orange line as opposed to a major highway. Uh, then Johnson's war uh, on poverty and um, an, an, a tremendous amount of uh, goodwill invested in wanting to fight uh, poverty and reduce the, the amounts uh, of people who are living in poverty, uh, but then there's this pivot to the war on crime. Right, and so instead of investing in making sure that people are healthy and well and have resources, we feel the solution then becomes to incarcerate people and lock people up. And this is happening in the midst of the Nixon era. I mean, the, both bills were under Johnson, but the shift in the investment happens in the Nixon era. And there's a lot of documentation that's come out now about some of the dog whistle politics. I mean, folks have known all along, but um, you know, I think it's uh, Ehrlichman, uh, who's one of Nixon's uh, chiefs, uh, either chief of staff or someone on his staff who talked about how race was a specific motivation uh, for how they were arguing on their campaign. Uh, and, and, um, you know, and so you see that this emphasis on crime and the othering that happens, right? The candidate who's the tough on crime uh, candidate and the t candidate that's going to keep America safe. And it's eerily familiar. I don't know where I've heard that besides this, but th that's what was happening then. Um, and then, of course, uh, the war on drugs where this is increased investment in criminalizing uh, communities based on the type of uh, drugs that are used in those communities. And that's when you see some of the, the in larger investments in policing in certain communities and uh, larger uh, or more resources given to prosecutors by the types of uh, offenses that they can charge people with and uh, the, the sentencing disparities that come uh, with crack cocaine and powder cocaine. It's a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity crack versus uh, powder cocaine. That's since been changed, but here we are in the midst of an opioid crisis here in Massachusetts, and we have legislators right now that are arguing to create more mandatory minimums for opioids. And we're trying to push the other way because we learned that the war on drugs was a failure. Uh, but I digress. So what have we sown? Uh, we have sown mass incarcerations through the war on drugs. Uh, we're the world leader. Uh, in incarceration at 5% of the world's population, but 25% uh, of the incarcerated population. Um, illicit drug use in America is 8.8% among whites, 9.6% uh, among blacks, but yet black folks make up 62% of those serving drug-related sentences. Here in Massachusetts, blacks and Latinos make up roughly 22% of the Commonwealth's population. We make up 57% of the people who are serving drug sentences. But then when you look at people who are serving mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses, that number skyrockets up to 75%. Some of the health uh, impacts. And, and again, I have to give uh, credit uh, where credit is due. Uh, I'm not a public health official, so I'm, I'm, I'm gleaning from the work of Dr. Krieger and her colleagues um, in a Lancet article, the America Equity and Equ Equality in Health, uh, Structural Racism and Health Inequities in the USA, Evidence and Interventions, uh, as well as another um, in that series, Mass Incarceration, Public Health, and Widening Inequality in the USA by Christopher Wildman and Emily uh, Wang. But the health impacts of incarceration, and, and this is where I kind of turn it over uh, to the experts and just really list what's out there, but posit this for us to think about. Uh, the increase uh, in transmission of uh, sexually transmitted disease, uh, chronic diseases tend to be um, uh, diagnosed at much more advanced stages for people who are incarcerated. 90% uh, of the people who are released are released without health care. Uh, formerly incarcerated folks are 12, more, 12 times more likely than the general public to die within two weeks 
following release. Now, a bit of a disclaimer, some of that includes people who are medical transfers that are terminally ill um, and they're going to die anyway. Um, but those are still significant um, disparities that exist. Um, the, the, the struggles that are associated with being released, finding uh, work, finding housing. People oftentimes who have relatives who live in subsidized housing cannot go live in that subsidized housing with them because they have a conviction. Um, uh, people, there was a study done by, I believe, Professor Bruce Western, uh, who was at Harvard, now I think he's at Columbia, that looked at employment rates. And, um, you know, it, it showed, you know, comparing similarly situated populations, uh, um, both people with co uh, prior convictions, but, uh, but a, a black man with a prior conviction with a high school diploma versus a white man with a prior conviction and no high school diploma, uh, the black man is less likely uh, to be employed. And so you, you take the prior conviction and add that the complications of trying to find housing and not having health care and not being able to live with a family member who may be living on subsidized housing. And these complicate uh, the situation for them. Uh, more statistics um, around people who are homeless uh, and the connection between prior incarceration. Uh, uh, mental health impacts of incarceration. Um, this, this statistic um, really grabbed me. There's an estimated 16 to 24 percent who are in uh, prisons or jails who have a serious mental illness. Um, that's in light of the fact that there are, you know, well above 50 percent um, who have some sort of drug dependence. And if you have been around the criminal law reform circles in Massachusetts for any time, you've probably come across Sheriff Steve Tompkins, who talks about the population of people at his facility. And his numbers are just on par uh, with this. There are so many people in there, right, that because of the deinstitutionalization of mental health services, we use our prisons and jails. Uh, to serve that population, and it's just, it's, it's bad policy, uh, it's bad public safety, uh, and it's just mean-spirited. We've got to do better. Uh, many prisons and jails don't provide people with methadone. Uh, and this last statistic, that's the Massachusetts statistic that just uh, came out uh, not too long ago. Uh, people who have uh, opioid use disorder uh, who are released are 120 times more likely to overdose upon release than compared to members of the general population. But yet, we have lawmakers who want to double down on a failed relic of a war on drugs and take this approach for political reasons, right? Because what does a politician say to the family who's lost a loved one who overdosed on heroin? well, we need to lock those people up and send them away forever. But what gets missed in that conversation is a lot of the times the people who are selling are also users themselves. Uh, they're selling to maintain a habit. They're selling to share with friends. Not that that is the absolute, but that is a significant part of that population. The impact on community. Um, Keeping in mind, again, the racial disparities that exist, on top of uh, the concentrations of poverty, the hyper-segregated communities that we live in that are an outgrowth of the Jim Crow era and the redlining and blockbusting and white flight. And so all of those different things along the way contribute to the makeup of cities as we see them today. And and when you think about all of those factors and you add incarceration on top of it and you think about the health impacts, um, you know, children born in the 90s, I don't know how many of you all were born in the 90s. Um, don't say anything because I don't want to feel <laughs> older. Um, I had a 25.1% uh, chance uh, of having an incarcerated father. Uh, and that jumps up to 50% uh, if the father had no high school. 
and half of black women have family or extended family members imprisoned compared to only 12% of white women. Half. I, I just, I don't know any statistic that impacts that many people of a particular demographic. And it, it's more troubling when you think about the impact that incarceration has. Decreased contributions to the family, the costs of keeping in touch. These telecommunications companies are running highway robbery through these prisons and jails, charging these exorbitant rates for people to make collect calls. Meanwhile, some of the sheriffs get kickbacks on, not kickbacks, but they get a portion of the, the revenue that's generated from these calls for people who don't have a job um, and who are incarcerated and are more times often than not coming from a poor family that they're calling back to. Uh, the impact on romantic relationships, the stress of having an incarcerated family member, reduce of social supports, um, men less likely to be involved in contributing to the care of, of their children, and you know, children with incarcerated parents are more likely uh, to be involved, uh, system involved. I mentioned this report by Mass Inc, uh, the, the geography of in, incarceration. Uh, these statistics, again, they looked at segments, and I wish I had the, the graphic, I should have included that. They looked at segments of the city of Boston, um, Fields Corner, Grove Hall, I think Codman Square, and in certain segments of the city, 50% of the homes were touched by incarceration. So that's basically every other house. There is somebody that is either incarcerated or has been incarcerated. And then they did an analysis of how much money is being spent on incarcerating people from that community. And it was like for one community, it was like 1.4 million in a given year. It's just like, what could that have been spent on instead of locking people up. So there should be a new harvest, and this is where I will end. Um, and this, from Dr. Krieger again, this is amazing. I had to pull this and put this in there, uh, this web science search, and this is to the, those of you all who are medical professionals, medical students, uh, this search that was done uh, of a web search with the term race and health and disease. Look how many articles there are, y'all. 47,855 articles when you look at race and health. But then when you talk about racial discrimination, that jumps down to 2,061. And then when you replace uh, race with racism, it goes to 1996. But when you talk about structural or systemic racism, there are only 195 articles. So that says something about what's not being done, what's not getting talked about, what's not happening. And so there's the need for a new conversation in the academy about racism and not just race. Um, because I think when we just talk about race, it's easy to other people, right? You know, I saw something the other day, a headline that was talking about Hollywood's black problem. Hollywood ain't got a black problem, they got a white problem. Because there's too many white folks making decisions, keeping black folks and Latino folks and other folks out. That's the problem. So until we begin to change our perspective, change our language, change how we orient ourselves to approaching these problems, we're still going to have uh, these issues. And so. Uh, it is my, my hope uh, that this is, the, is part of an ongoing conversation for many of you who are either interested in this work or involved in this work, uh, or that this is the beginning uh, of a conversation for you because this really needs to change. And, you know, like I said, I, I'm, I'm far from the expert on this area, but I tell you what, uh, the next time I'm going up to legislators to talk, this is something that, because I'm just looking at it from who's incarcerated um, and how many people are cycling through the system. But what does that mean? 
right? We can talk about lack of access to jobs, but, but what does that mean beyond lack of access to jobs? We can talk about people being stopped and frisked and living in over-policed communities, but, but what does that mean? It means people are dying. If, if, if we're not approaching this issue uh, with this lens of structural racism and trying to solve it from that perspective, we're allowing people to die because we have a system of incarceration that operates in this country uh, that is setting people up for failure. So thank you. Uh, I'll entertain any questions, but I think the, the better answers to any questions you might have are probably going to come from the panelists following me. So thanks. So we have time for Q&A. If, if you notice, there's a microphone in front of you. Um, to hold, to uh, speak, hold the button down and uh, keep it down while you're asking your entire question. Otherwise, uh, the audience will, may not be able to hear you. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A with uh, Mr. Hall. Hello. I'm in the back. back oh, hi. <laughs> You um, mentioned the work that's happening right now with criminal justice reform, and I wonder if you um, are at liberty to share some of the House representatives who, um, what's, what's the holdup for the House representatives who are liberal but aren't yet on the, what I would consider the right side of these issues? So uh, I guess what are the leverage points mm -hmm. and, and places where you might you know, be it where the ACLU or GBIO or other organizations are thinking, like, we could push them, you know, and is this information the type of thing that might push people over? You would like to think that this information is the type of thing that pushes people over, um, but I've come to learn that that doesn't trump politics. And the reality is, uh, even though, I like to say in Massachusetts we suffer from liberal exceptionalism, we think that we vote because we vote democratically and we've, you know, uh, passed same-sex marriage as a law that we've got other things figured out. And we have all of these Democrats who are in elected office, but in reality, uh, there are a lot of conservatives. Um, and so if you look at the House of Representatives, it's probably evenly split a third, a third, a third, conservative Republicans, conservative moderate Democrats, and then progressives. Um, and so from the perspective of House leadership, um, there are certain votes that people will have to take that if they are in a purple district or even a red district, but they're a Democrat, somebody could run against them and challenge them. So for instance, there was a vote, this happened in the Senate, and even though it's a different body, it's the same thing. Uh, there was a, uh, an amendment to the Senate's version of the crime bill uh, to make uh, assault and battery on a police officer a mandatory minimum, or an enhancement would be applied. Um, and at first the vote came down, it was like 18 to 16. But then when the, the, the 16 realized they lost, they were like, no, 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 let, let's do it over again, because I don't want people to say, because they did a roll call vote, so everybody had to go through and say yay or nay. And so they said, I, I don't want the cops in my community to see that I voted against making assault and battery on a police officer a mandatory minimum. So they took the vote over again, and it was 30 to 6. So it's, it's, it's that type of stuff. And so again, in the midst of an opioid crisis, when we're talking about repeal mandatory minimums, you have the district attorneys come out and say, we're just going to open up the jails and let drug dealers out, when that's not how that works. But that's a scare tactic, and that's fear mongering that they do. And a lot of times, a district attorney who is the district attorney for a county uh, has more constituents than a particular legislator in a representative district. So if they say, I'm the law and order guy and this is a bad thing, the state reps are going to listen uh, to them unless they're really grounded in their principles uh, on their progressive values. So I think those are some of the things uh, that impacted a lot of the, uh, another piece of it is folks just don't care. It don't, it don't impact them. Right? There's not police coming through their community, rounding folks up, throwing folks up against the wall, shaking down kids, charging people with school zones and mandatory minimums, just 
So it, it doesn't touch their reality. They're concerned about uh, other legislative priorities. And then when it's time to vote, they're like, I don't know, who do I talk to about this? Law enforcement, and what's law enforcement gonna say? So hope that answers your question. Thank you. I'm wondering, what do you think it would take for, I'm wondering what do you think it would take for um, uh, for us to move toward legislation that would result in the retroactive uh, reduction in sentencing for those that are still being impacted by the war on drugs. But while we're kind of in a public health context of uh, fighting the opioid epidemic, uh, which is of course primarily affecting white communities, do you see uh, any, any hope in using that uh, public health lens or that context uh, to then hopefully reduce sentences for those who are still um, kind of under uh, the uh, condemnation, would you say, uh, of the war on drugs? Sure, I, mean, I, I think that's part of what we're trying to do. We, um, we've been trying to argue that you know, law enforcement will argue public safety, and we, we're saying public health is public safety. Um, and you know, by reducing the sentences that people are serving on these lengthy mandatory minimum sentences, that's less time that they're in a facility, that's less bodies that are being housed, that frees up more money that can go to treatment. Um, and so the mon because the money for treatment has got to go come from somewhere. It costs roughly $55,000 to incarcerate someone for a year, but it costs about $8,000 for an in-house uh, in treatment bed. Right, but, and, and, and it's never a question as to whether or not the Department of Correction is going to make its budget. It's never a question. Nobody's talking about, oh, it looks like we're going to have to cut prisons. Nobody ever says that. But when it's talking time for cuts, we're ready to cut mental health facilities or treatment facilities, and we're scrounging and scraping to figure out how we're going to pay for that. Let some of these people out of jail. And so, and, and, and so I think by saying that you know, the way that we deal with this addiction issue is by treating it as a public health issue and treating it through a public health lens that incarceration is not the solution. And to the extent that there are folks that we feel as a society need to be incarcerated, let's make sure there are as few of them as possible so that we can free up some of that money to provide treatment services to the people who are incarcerated, but more importantly, the people who aren't yet uh, incarcerated. Uh, and, so, and, so, and, and so legislatively, that's a big lift. Um, uh, and I, I think it takes work, and I think it would take a, a, a concerted effort uh, from the legal and advocacy community and the health community uh, to really kind of come up with a strategy. So I'm, I'm, I'm open to working with folks to figure that out. So. Now, I'm wondering if you could speak for a moment about the connection between structural racism, incarceration, and then voting suppression. And you, is, is there much political opportunity now that ACLU is looking at to get vote to get convicted felons who have served their time the right to vote? I know this is a state by state issue, but where, where is that at? Yeah, it, I mean it is a state by state issue. Uh, fortunately, here in Massachusetts, um, formerly incarcerated people who are convicted of felonies can vote once they've been released. Um, you just can't vote if you're serving a sentence for a felony. Uh, but in other states, there have been initiatives, I think we saw in Virginia, where they reinstated the right of, I think it was like 160,000 formerly incarcerated people who had felonies, their right to vote. Uh, and we see what happened in uh, uh, Virginia. I'm, you know, whether or not those 160,000 <laughs> turned the tide, I don't know. <laughs> Let, you know, let the current occupant of the White House tell you is just like, yeah, you let these criminals out and they're going to vote for bad people. But um, uh, so I, the ACLU is engaged in those conversations. We're not engaged in it here. But to, to the conversation around structural racism, again, you know, we look at the, the prison population in, in Massachusetts. Uh, it's 54 percent people of color. Uh, a, a majority of those people who are in these facilities like Cedar Junction and Shirley and Concord and Framingham, uh, where there aren't significant concentrations of people of color, the census counts them where they are detained. And so the resources from the census um, when they're divvied up go to those communities, but they don't go to the communities where the people came from, right? And so the conversation around prison gerrymandering, can we, 
uh, craft the legislative districts in such a way that if there's a prison in that district, um, you know, the, they don't get as much um, or they're not as counted for as many people because some of those people are there only because they are incarcerated. Or if a particular community has sent a certain percentage uh, of people um, who have left, lost a certain percentage of people due to incarceration, do they get a larger uh, representation uh, within the redistricting or within the population count for the census? So those are some of the things that I think need to be uh, considered to think creatively about that, but but this is again how structural racism works because this is an institution that ex exists within society that is disproportionately impacting poor people uh, and poor and people of color uh, and serves to disadvantage them even beyond just being incarcerated. We have time for one more question over here. Um, in talking about criminal justice reform. Where do immigration detention centers fit into the narrative? And then additionally, is there any data or research surrounding the health disparities that affect that particular subpopulation? Uh, I, I don't know if there is research or data on that. There probably is, um, but I'm not certain. Uh, and as far as um, the connection between um, kind of criminal the criminal legal system and in immigration detention, mostly all of the sheriffs uh, have 287G agreements, which you know will they will detain people for ICE, um, and so to the extent that um, incarceration rates have gone down, uh, these facilities and that and that's I guess it's important to say is you let five people go from a prison you don't get an immediate savings because there's these fixed costs. The, the, the cost of the building, the cost of the staff, the cost of the food, these long-term contracts that you have. You don't really start seeing savings until you're closing whole facilities. Um, that said, some of these facilities have, have lost significant um, population um, because of the decline in incarceration, uh, but they use those wings to detain people uh, for ICE. And so they are people who have civil infractions, right? They haven't committed crimes, but they are being detained civilly. They're in a jail. That's problematic, uh, just on a basic human level, uh, how we're treating people. Uh, so um, if there's not uh, research out there and data on it, though, uh, maybe we can find somebody to go do that. Thank you. Dr. Donna Shalala, Tuesday, November 14th, speaking about universal health care and IDEA. Building CMC, health care to Website, and you can look at that. And also, um, Dr. Danielle Allen will be. Sessions that I encourage you to register for, attend. Um, I want to bring up uh, two individuals, unfortunately, uh, one of them is not here today, but I'd like to bring up um, Director of Diversity and Inclusion in Medicine. of Medicine, models research include evaluating health outcomes and He has been involved in several independent research and articles in the American Journal of Medicine. Folks in the room, he is the UCCMP. He also participated in the Health Fund Harvard University Fellowship 
and relay. We also obtain the cluster. I also want to bring up Dr. Nancy Krieger. She is a professor of social epidemiology and uh, American Cancer Society clinical professor at the Department of Social and School of Public Health, director of the HSPH interdisciplinary concentration group for women, gender, PhD in epidemiology from the University of California. Informed by an analysis that Frameworks to understand, analyze, and improve the feature, including equal, uh, equal sensitivity of disease. He uh, also does research on population health and health. Finally, uh, methodologic research. I want to say thank you and welcome to our. Aside from just reading their bios and listening, give um, each of our presenters a chance to uh, talk about the wonderful work that they're doing. And then we're going to really dive into this discussion about race, racism, and health. Uh, and these two are experts in uh, uh, both clinical and public health. And I think they're going to bring a lot to the discussion. And as you hear their conversations and you hear their presentations, start to think about the questions that you have um, for them. Um, because I want you all to be engaged in this conversation and not only talk about the problems, but also really to start to figure out some solutions that we can start to uh, uh, implement in order to address health disparities. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Castellanos first. Thank you very much. And uh, it really is a pleasure to come back to HMS and uh, get a chance to um, speak to, uh, with all of you. Um, a little bit about my, uh, my research and the work that I've done. Um, I've been interested in health disparities for, for quite a while, and a lot of it stemmed from uh, when I was younger. I noticed, that, um, uh, I noticed that a lot of the patients we were taking care of um, were being managed by physicians who were white, mainly. Did not really see that many minority uh, physicians. So as I went through my years, I started noticing that um, Again, many of the surgeons who were taking care of certain patients were a specific race ethnicity. So I got really interested in learning more about that. Um, I had a, the opportunity to work with Dr. John Aganian here at the School of Public Health, and we were to actually look at the big data sets here in Massachusetts as well as in, in California. And the premise was to find out um, what type of patients are being taken care of by the surgeons who have the highest quality, right? So we know that there are registries out there um, that end up describing the type of surgeons that are taking care of uh, our patients who have cardiovascular illnesses, primarily open heart surgery. And we know that th some surgeons do a better job than others. It has to do based on the structure surrounding the physician, uh, that is the hospital, the nurses, the staff, uh, the su support structures. And it's those types of surgeons tend to do a better job than other physicians. And, and again, but one of the things that we learn is that not the, the, the distribution of the patients was not equitable. That some patients were being taken care of by physicians who had a, a lower quality score compared to um, other, um, other physicians. So we actually ended up taking the the data set out of, from Massachusetts and inclu included over 100,000 patients who had open heart surgery and ended up breaking up based on deciles and quartiles. And the surgeons who had the highest risk adjusted mortality rate or were described as having the worst um, outcomes were predominantly taking care of patients who were of, of ethnic minority status, meaning that African Americans and Latino patients were being taken care of by the surgeons who had the highest risk adjusted mortality rates. Conversely, the opposite was also true. That is, those surgeons that had the lowest risk adjusted mortality rates or were described as being a, a better 
provider, better provider, they were more likely to treat the white patients. So that really opened up a, um, a whole new view of looking at these surgeons. Why is it that those providers, those surgeons who have a higher um, quality score are primarily taking care of white patients? And the opposite being true, that those surgeons who have the lower quality score are taking care mainly of minority patients. So then we ended up doing um, some local um, analysis. Um, it, again, I, politics is, is local, right? Uh, and so we ended up going back to San Diego, my home institution, and looking at the county of San Diego and finding out, well, where are these providers uh, practicing mainly? And one of the things we ended up doing um, mapping, geo-mapping of the, of the county and ended up finding that um, predominantly the providers who had the highest uh, risk adjusted mortality rates or the lower quality scores were mainly located in areas that were predominantly populated by minority uh, communities. A national city, for example, Chula Vista, the outskirts of San Diego. And yet the opposite in which um, was also true, that is that providers who had a higher quality score or a lower risk adjusted mortality rate, um, again, this is adjudicated uh, risk adjusted uh, uh, scores provided to the surgeons, were primarily living in areas that had a higher income score, um, that is um, the wealthier uh, suburbs of San Diego, Del Mar, and the northern parts. Um, obviously, uh, this is just trends that we saw um, it, but it really pointed out a lot of the um, highlights of um, structural and geographic discrimination that is happening in, in the community. Um, that led me to um, explore some other avenues and looking at uh, rural communities. Again, San Diego is uh, in the neighboring counties. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, approximately 1.5 to 2 million people. And um, in the rural communities, we have a, a large amounts of ethnic minorities, mainly um, Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, um, Chinese, as well as um, Filipino communities, some Africans as well, but predominantly um, Mexican, Mexican-Americans, as well as um, the Latin American uh, contingency. And what we found um, by looking at that population as well, that again, a disproportionate number of those um, minority groups were being taken care of by those providers who did not necessarily have the highest quality uh, scores being provided by these national registries. So those are some of the things that I've, I've been involved with um, and uh, let Dr. Krieger give her experience. Thank you. I'm very glad to be part of this panel and to have real attention being brought here at the medical school to issues of structural racism and health. Um, this is a crucial issue for our times and part of what's going on now with the toxic politics in our country as well. And I'm just back from the American Public Health Association meeting and looking at the ways in which these kinds of issues intersect also with environmental racism and climate change. These are all pressing issues of our times. So just to say briefly, so I'm also a little tired because I did just get back from EPHA. Um, so I am a public health scientist, I'm a teacher, and I'm also an activist. My core focus is on health equity, the societal determination of health and health inequities, and that includes, and has been since the very beginning of my career, a strong focus on racism and health. The kinds of work I do are theoretical and conceptual, methodological, empirical, and pedagogical, and also trouble-making. And I will be giving you examples of all of the above. Um, and I got my original, some of my, just to give you a sense of where some of my roots are, is that I got very involved early on in the Jesse Jackson campaigns for presidency and the Rainbow Coalition. I was on his National Health Commission and wrote the AIDS platform for 1988. And that was really calling attention to the disproportionate impact on people of color. And that was not getting attention in the U.S. at that time and a useful way to start to push the needle on the discussion of what some of the issues are that are key. So let me give just quickly a few different kinds of examples about the types of work that are important to think about because the point is, is there's no one way to do work on racism and health. It's multifaceted, multi-level, 
and long term. So there's lots of ways to do work. And some may see the complexity as overwhelming and daunting. I see it as that many more entry points to do good work and to make a difference. And it's understanding that we're all part of something way bigger than us, that with deep roots and many generations before us that have been fighting these fights, we're part of that. And so we do our parts and we do them conscious of the other parts and who has come before and what we want for those who come after. So first, on theory, as was mentioned, I've been doing a lot of work on the eco-social theory of disease distribution that I've developed, which among other things focuses centrally on how people embody literally their biological and societal context in the historical generation in which they find themselves and do so over their life course. And it's a multi-level way of thinking and it allows us to start to tease apart two important constructs that usually aren't talked about, which is to understand when you look at racial ethnic inequities in health, you have to distinguish between what are biological expressions of racism, how does racism affect us biologically, how does it get into people's bodies, into their minds, into the relationships between people that affects how their health practices are, the kinds of areas where they live, all of the different pathways involved, and distinguish that from racialized expressions of biology which is how scientific racism has given us centuries of approaches of looking at biology and saying that there are innately distinct races, some inferior and some superior. Despite endless attempts to repudiate this, every new technological advance brings new possibilities for finding another nook and cranny of biology in which to say that people are fundamentally different races. This isn't the time to go into the full lecture of that, but knowing the history is important. Um, so that's where use of theoretical constructs can really help clarify why we do see inequities and where do we look for their causes and why structural racism is so important. In terms of methodologic work, I've done a lot of work on different kinds of measures that can be used to measure exposure to racial discrimination, including self-report measures, which always have all the limitations of what self-report measures are because they refer to what people are willing and also able to say. And if you have internalization, it's hard to say things that you can't even say to yourself and also using implicit, the methodology that's been used for implicit bias, the implicit association test, to start to develop new methods to try to use that methodology to get at people's experiences of, of discrimination and being targeted. But I've also been recently turning to new work to improve measures of residential segregation and particularly developing new measures of racialized economic segregation. Because in the US, the long history is studying racial segregation, not taking into account economic factors, and also only being able to use measures that can be uh, implemented at things like the city level where you're looking at distributions of census tracts and how does that relate to what happens with the distribution of people across cities, thereby not being able to look at local levels for inequities. And there are new measures that are out there and I've been doing research and showing that it's actually quite powerful and something that I'm designing with a keen eye on how this can be used by public health departments and cancer registries as well as researchers to better monitor health inequities and tie them to their structural roots. Um, in terms of empirical research, just to give two examples of current work that engage with the question of structural racism in health, one right now with my doctoral student Justin Feldman is continuing on my work from a few years ago and also first how I met uh, Dr. Mr. Hall is about police killings and how do you count them and taking the stance that these are killings their deaths. We in public health tend to count a lot of dead people. That's sort of what we do and how our profession develop. So how come these can't be counted? And so we did early work uh, calling for that, beginning to look at what the trends were, putting it, of course, historically. And then what Justin has just completed and published in PLOS Med the other week it was the first study to systematically compare the data from the Guardians, the project that counted, against US national mortality records, clearly demonstrating that vital statistics ca capture literally about 45%, like may as well flip a coin, of what the deaths are that are actually due to police killings and then what the question comes up of what's going on with coroners and others that so many deaths are not accurately being reported. Um, the Guardian, by the way, caught 96% of the deaths. And there were the, worse, the worser inequities in undercounting were for people, not surprisingly, who were young, who were black, who lived in more rural and low-income counties. And there also, the other thing that comes up from these data, which has not, not been adequately studied or reported, is the lethality of tasers. Um, and that the data are worse than what people are saying, that this is not a dangerous methodology. 
but in a very different guise, because it depends on what day of the week you find me, what kinds of work you're going to see me doing. I've just also published the first studies that look at the impact of being born in a Jim Crow state on type of breast cancer estrogen receptor that women have when diagnosed with breast cancer, because a lot of my work is actually on breast cancer. Um, some of my early training was in cancer epidemiology, and my initial background is in biochemistry. And so in that, we showed for the first time that being born in a Jim Crow state, particularly before 1965, increased the likelihood of black women getting diagnosed with ER negative tumors as compared to those who are not born in Jim Crow states. And there was no Jim Crow effect for the white woman. And the follow-up study that we've just done, published, it's the advanced access uh, version is available in the American Journal of Epi, shows also really important an enormous rise, a good thing, in ER positive tumors among young black women in Jim Crow states from prior times to now, making it really clear that the determinants of ER status are extrinsic to the body, and that makes a lot of sense if you know anything about the evolutionary history of the estrogen receptor. So finally, in terms of teaching, um, in my courses, it's key in my pedagogy to teach about the history of scientific racism, to teach about eugenics in this country, which most students are not trained in, even though it was mainstream thought, as in like big time, like college presidents, like presidents of Harvard University, um, and other such things, and know about, uh, so it's really critical, and, and, it's, and people don't know that history, and if you don't know that history, well, we know what happens, it gets bound to be repeated, and repeated horribly. And I also, at the same time, looked to um, other kinds of teaching that are not just in the classroom, and was key in helping to organize an event that we had at school, our school across the way earlier this May, on looking at the implications of slavery for public health, past, present, and future. And what's, le what's also led to is a transformation of the space in our school, whereby in the central area there were only the portraits of prior deans and key administrators in the school, and take a guess, that meant they were predominantly white men. And it's been very alienating. And this wasn't always the case. This got done by the prior dean. They all went up in this front central area. And so what, we, so what one of the staff members in in black in the um, Office of Diversity and Inclusion had the brilliant idea to contact people down at the street at Mass College of the Arts. And an artist there, Lisa Rakowski, developed what she calls a series of ghost portraits. And if you haven't been to our central atrium, you should come see them. Because what they are are portraits of prior generations of black and indigenous healers, key medical figures, key leading figures who were healers who could not be there because of what discrimination did and whose contributions have not been recognized. And putting those portraits up in dialogue with the portraits that are there has completely transformed the space. And it's been meaningful to faculty, staff, and students alike. So literally, it's just, how many of you have seen it? OK, a few of you have. That's good. Bring other people over. It makes a difference. And there's little placards up that explain who all the people are. So the larger point is that if we don't raise these questions, we get the wrong answers and we get answers that can harm people. You all have taken the Hippocratic Oath, the first do no harm, that applies in population health research as well. And it's really critical that the point here is we're not trying to use these health data to show that racism is bad. It is, a priori, by definition. What we are trying to do is understand the health impacts of racism so that we can identify them, pinpoint the causes, make policy changes to change them. And I think another point is that we do this because we also need to see these data, not just to despair, but rather to provide hope. Because actually, this last little bit of research I'll talk about was looking at trends in premature mortality in this US, because I was very disturbed in the 1990s when some people were beginning to say that, oh, it's OK that there's health inequities and they're widening, because you know, the better off people always get better faster, but everybody's rates are going down. Well, actually, that's data, as I suspected, that holds only from 1980 onwards, which is the onset of, obviously, the neoliberal regime intensified. In fact, if you look at what happened with premature mortality rates in the U.S. between 1960 and 1980, rates were going down for everybody, which is a very good thing. And guess what? War on poverty, civil rights, and a few other minor details. And the rates were going down even faster for people who were of color and people who were low income. The gaps were closing. It's not inevitable that health inequities have to rise as mortality rates fall. That's why we do this work, because people come to really wrong answers if they don't think about the impacts of structural racism on health. So as you can see, our panelists are very passionate about the work that they do, and they're going to bring a lot to this discussion. Um, I have a couple of questions, but just show of hands, questions for the uh, from the audience. Any questions out there? 
Really, this is going to be a quiet discussion then. Okay, I didn't see much happening. All right, um, so I do have a couple of questions, so hopefully to start the conversation, and then hopefully you all uh, um, find that last pep in your step for the next 20 or so minutes, and you can engage with our panelists. Um, but I'll start with you, uh, Luis. And so how have you seen racism on a structural level impact the individuals that you take care of on, on a daily basis? So taking it down from the, the macro level to the micro level on your patient care, how have you seen the impact of, uh, of racism on your patients? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Again, uh, as a cardiologist clinician, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in the hospitals. Um, again, I feel it's very important for me to actually be in the trenches to actually see patients, not just um, um, teaching or, or, um, or, or doing research. Um, and one of the um, things I've noticed, um, and, and again, that story going back, is that um, I was on call not too long ago, and um, one of the physicians called me for a patient who had a SVT, supraventricular tachycardia. It's like, all right, fine, I'll go ahead and see the patient. Um, but no explanation why the patient had the SVT. Uh, I said, well, did you run the labs? Yeah, okay, what was the tox screen? It's like, oh, this patient um, doesn't do drugs. It's like, did you ask him? No, but he just doesn't look like the type of patient who would do drugs. Like, did you run the drug screen? No. It's like, all right, I'll see the patient. Call the hospitalist, ask him to, um, do a drug screen. I went back to see the patient, and as you would expect, is a young, white, um, blonde, blue-eyed patient. The patient, I've worked with this hospitalist before, uh, at the ER physician, and she has no problems running tox screens on African-American patients or Latino patients. You know, the tox screen came back positive, all right? Um, so that just shows you, and again, this is one example of many that I could recount and tell you, that um, this type of structural racism in, in, in the you know, healthcare providers exists, uh, where uh, just based on the color of your skin, the way you look, you assume as actually being clean, quote unquote. Um, that's just um, one brief example at the, at the local level. And Nancy, on a, on a macro level and overall health and a community health, how have you seen racism sort of play out in some of the research that you've been doing? So I've just described two examples, which are the work I'm doing now on measures of racialized economic segregation, and I'll bring that home to the work that I've done with that specifically in Boston in a sec. And then also this work on Jim Crow, and I'd like to flag that it's actually when I started beginning to do work on looking at the impact of Jim Crow on, data, on health data in the United States, I was shocked because literally the number of studies could be counted on one hand, like five. And they were on infant mortality predominantly. And so I started to expand that, looking at not only infant mortality or infant death outcomes, but also looking at premature mortality. And then now taking this, and these two studies I've just recounted to you about Jim Crow and the breast cancer estrogen receptor are the first studies to look at Jim Crow in any way in relation to any cancer outcome. And moreover, in terms of cancer, having just been writing up some new results right now, there's literally only, I tell you, 34 studies, 34, right, 34, that have looked at racial segregation, any kind of segregation, in relation to cancer. A chunk of those look at questions of uh, stage diagnosis, treatment, survival, and outcomes. I've done one on biomarkers. There's a few other odds and ends. There's some on the exposure in terms of environmental toxics, uh, air pollution particularly, that are to exposure to carcinogenic substances. But like, you can probably guess how many articles there are out there on oncology <laughs> and how many articles there are out there per the same literature search strategy that you showed from the Lancet article of why I did that literature search, of course. Um, <laughs> that's sort of, I live in the computer and like, and you need to work with the librarians at Countley if you really want to learn how to do properly a literature search. Um, that's also part of my teaching with my students. Um, and you can imagine there are reams of articles, hundreds of, they're on race and cancer that there are only 34 articles in the literature on residential segregation, racial segregation, and cancer, that's actually like absurd. So you start to use this lens and you start to see that the impact is two things. One is you're looking at the ev empirical evidence about what the impact is on health, but secondly, you're looking at the impact on the ideas that people have that they wouldn't even bother to ask these research questions in the first place. So, you know, in clinical medicine, um, IOM now, National Academy of Medicine, 
you know, release unequal treatment, and it's a statement uh, to the extent of health disparities. And I think we've done a fairly decent job in sort of defining health disparities and, and, and how they exist in our and in, in the practice of medicine. But um, how do we start to address some of these issues from a systemic level? And speaking about the work that you do, uh, Louise, uh, how do we uh, include discussions about race and racism uh, when we start to try and implement changes on a hospital level, on a, on a, on a larger scale level, as opposed to this direct individual um, pr patient or, or provider, provider level? Yeah, so that, that's, um, that's, a, that's a tall order. Um, but uh, we have to take it uh, one step at a time. Um, one, of, one of the other issues that I wanted to, to bring is, um, again, the area where I, li where, where I work in Southern California. It's a huge um, area that we take care of. Um, as I said, close to 2 million people that, that we provide um, care, not just cardiac care, but care in general. Uh, includes both San Diego County and Imperial County. Uh, Imperial County is um, uh, one of the um, counties in California that has the highest rates of unemployment. I'm talking about uh, approximately 23% unemployment for that county. Many of those patients are um, multi-ethnic um, backgrounds. We've talked about um, uh, about 60% of them are either Latinos or uh, from a different ethnic background, but they're not white. That also translates to the fact that um, many of those patients don't speak English. So what I'm getting at is the language barrier. Some of the issues that address the inability to communicate effectively with your healthcare provider and how that can also lead uh, to, to racism and, and discrimination. Um, one of the things that we notice is that many of the um, medical conditions were being missed by the providers by the inability to communicate effectively with a patient and not using uh, appropriate certified translators. Um, uh, and this was the case not just for uh, physiologic condition, but also more importantly for mental health, in which a lot of the mental health issues were actually been, been missed in the patients. So one of the things that what we uh, did to, to implement is actually um, decided to um, provide um, uh, certified interpretive services for our patients. So now uh, there's, um, there's some rules set up at the hospital level, the health system, that uh, physicians who do not speak the language of the patient they need to use an interpreter of the native language of that patient in order to communicate effectively to transmit the information across, but also for procedures um, in order to obtain appropriate consent. So um, it, it worked in, for, the, for the hospital because it was able to um, help communicate the information effectively and uh, eventually help reduce the readmission rates to the hospital. For, so for the hospital, it helped because it helped with the bottom line, that is saving dollars. But for the providers, and as a, as, a, as a physician, it helped me because it is able to uh, appropriately give the care that I needed to give to the patients and communicate that information effectively. So by implementing, implementing this, um, this rule of using appropriate translators, we're able to at least um, provide some of that care to the, to the patient. Nancy, I saw you writing notes. Did you have any comments that you wanted to jump in and add? No, I was, I was just uh, um, to, yes, um, <laughs> but I was writing notes about, not, yes, not in response to that because I think that what's clear and what I think I've, I've felt very much value about this panel is by virtue of having someone who is dedicated as a clinician and then someone like me who's a population health scientist, it's giving you two different lenses and also two different arenas of work. And that's really important because, again, this is complementary. It's not that one should do one or the other. There are some people who do bridge both. But there are also different venues for action. And changing institutions that are healthcare providing institutions is really, really, really important work. And changing community conditions is really, really, really important work. And it's not an either or, and it's not a better or worse than. It's a both. And it's important knowing this is what I mean about saying that you know that you've got allies in different places and that we are always trying to figure out who are your allies as well as who are your adversaries. And that becomes a common theme. Um, many analyses like to just talk about all the good things that we should all want for health equity, but don't talk about the obstacles. And you very much were importantly focusing on the many systemic obstacles where some groups of people are literally benefiting from the pain of others. Um, so I want to just keep that sort of framed as a perspective. But in terms of just two examples to bring up about the question of um, interventions that are addressing systemic and structural racism, 
One um, is an interesting one. I've just I told you, I'm just back from the American Public Health Association. And for that, I chair, and I'm also one of the co-founders of the Spirit of 1848 Caucus, which is linked, focused on the fundamental links between social justice and public health. Um, I encourage you to go to our website. You can just search under Spirit of 1848, because we have a very active listserv that is a way to share lots of information about these kinds of issues. And um, we were organizing all of our, and we focus on the social history of public health, the politics of public health data, and progressive pedagogy, and how to bring these things together. And one of the uh, presentations tied to also your concerns about some of the ex exact areas you're talking about in California was a woman who was presenting on what's going on with valley fever. And what's happening under the context of climate change is with a greater spatiotemporal um, range of nice, for them, arid areas for the spores, more people are at risk. And then the way that gentrification and mass incarceration are working to compound the problem in the Central Valley area and right north of Los Angeles is that because of gentrification, people of color, particularly black and Latinx, are being move, moving to where there's greater likelihood of exposure to the fungal spore that causes the disease. White people are moving out of those areas. Simultaneously, the prisons are in those areas, and the prisons have worse ventilation and are more dusty, and prisons are a known vector for getting this. So what happens then is that the combination is now you've got to bring together people in public health working on affordable housing and gentrification and prison reform, and they can together join forces with, a, with something that helps unite some of their analysis and their thinking, and that amplifies what the concerns are about the impacts of structural racism. And so that's an example where there's a very active coalition and a lot of youth very active in it right now that's happening in and around the Los Angeles area that takes this lens of structural racism and understands these connections between things that are not otherwise understood. And by the way, of course, the prevalence and incidence of valley fever are going up and are going up particularly in black and Latino populations in the California area. Um, but the other example that I want to give in a different way was that, um, as we all know, this summer, likely relevant to some of the election results as well, there was the horrific events in Charlottesville, Virginia, with the, riot, with the, the public daytime and evening rallies of the Klan, neo-Nazis out in force, with one person killed, many injured. And um, that was about the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. And we all know that there's attempts to act right now in the, as if the history of this country, somehow this Confederacy was a legitimate government. And what isn't appreciated is that the same city council decision, the same election uh, meeting that approved the taking down of the statue also approved a, many millions of dollars for what effectively could be called reparations that dealt with exactly what you were talking about with regard to the way that urban development vote happened in the 1960s in that city that where, where African Americans were effectively disenfranchised from that vote at that time, it was before the civil rights, the laws were passed around voting rights acts, where a slim majority of the population approved tearing down the, what was the central district for the African American community and its business area and destroyed the economy and the community. And what this work, what these funds are now doing is trying to begin to redress that. And it's a recognition of the impact of structural racism that has now freed up the funds to actually make a difference. And that just didn't get as much press. But that's where some of these decisions can go when you start to name it. And part of where the funding was going to go was to some public health initiatives, was to more uh, funds for GED courses, was to improve conditions in public housing, all things that matter for health. So I think that we need to think about these kinds of examples and make the connections and make the connections because people care about their health, the health of their parents and the health of their children and their community. And this is about living healthier lives and dignified lives and loving lives and the possibilities that are needed to make that equally available for everyone. Thank you. Um, quick shameless plug about a project that we will be doing as part of our Equity and Social Justice series. Um, in March 20th of 2018, we will host a discussion on housing and its impact on health. So mark your calendars, be on the lookout for that. We'll be announcing that one soon. Um, I quickly want to pivot and turn to uh, Mr. Hall and I'll ask if you have any questions for our panelists and then I'll open it up for the rest of the, for the audience as well. No. 
the pass. Perfect. All right, I saw a couple hands. I'll go here, and then I'll go here. Yes, ma'am. Um, I had a PhD student who was based at uh, the University of Alabama in Birmingham working on uh, pediatric renal transplants. And it had just been very common that uh, renal transplants in African-American children had just failed and were failing at a much higher rate. And the automatic kind of response of those around was just to kind of blame them for being poorly compliant. And actually what it was, and the research that we did, it was actually an immunosuppressive regime that had been worked out on white children. Um, but it was so easy for so many lives, you know, because this is costing lives, for lives to have been lost because of a default position of lazy, poor compliance, that's the reason, rather than actually trying to say, this is unexpected, and look for the reasons. And so uh, I'm, just, I'm just struck by the sort of description that you set in your keynote as, as this spiral, this cycle, that we somehow are failing to intervene in ways that are evidence-based. And I just, I want you to give us some hope that the interventions that we can collectively work on will change this cycle um, because we're losing lives, but we're losing so much talent from society. So, Luis, would you like to? Y first yeah, no, I know. I, you know, I, I'm the type of person that sees the the, uh, the glass uh, uh, half full, you know, versus half empty. I I, I think I I'm an optimist by heart and. Um, uh, there's a, I agree, you know, you have a, a complex problem and it means you have multiple channels, multiple ways of tackling the problem. And um, I, what I can say is that uh, you have to just be optimistic and learn from the experiences and move on. You know, in, in medicine, we see this often, at least in, in our cardiology clinics, um, where um, a lot of the patients who were not showing up to the clinics um, were being referred to as a non-compliant or not necessarily taking their medications, but when you actually do the research and, and dive down into the issues surrounding it, you find out they actually have transportation issues. There's no public uh, transportation, at least uh, readily available public transportation they could take them from their home to the clinic. Sometimes they have to take three different buses to get there or uh, they don't have necessarily the, uh, the funds to, to buy their, their medications, right? So um, th those issues then need to be taken into context, at least realizing that, hey, sure, the patient is not necessarily showing up to the clinic, is not taking their medications, but you need to try to find out that, what's going on. So uh, at least in San Diego, what we can tell you is that we've been very proactive and now actually expanding. It is a $2 billion a project to expand the, uh, the subway to actually move um, some of the rails are actually expanding it from downtown San Diego to actually to La Jolla, where uh, uh, over two billion dollars of infrastructure has been spent on building medical centers, which again, that's a whole different issue. Again, the allocation of resources in a particular community that's already um, very highly well taken care of. Uh, but again, that's where the, the medical centers are being built. Uh, why don't we just actually build the public transportation so that our patients can actually make it there and get the care they, 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 they can receive. And then what I would um, ask, because I don't know the literature, but I would know that my framework would ask me to say, I'm usually dubious when I hear that there are differential tests or differential regimes to be prescribed for people uh, by socially designated racial ethnic groups. And I'll give a real example. Um, because it's not so obvious to know who is quote unquote white and who is quote unquote black and who is a lot of other different things as well. And also remembering that we really are just one human species and there are some differences in ancestry here and there, but by and large, we're mainly the same and our experiences are profoundly different. Is that in the case of breast cancer and hormone therapy and cardiovascular disease, not thinking about who was being studied was a huge problem. And that what was going on with the tests that were happening with regard to hormone therapy was that there was the observation that there was reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, which is what led to the Women's Health Initiative study, was, oops, by the way, it turns out, looking back retrospectively, who was mainly being looked at were wealthy white women. So, because that's who was getting the drugs. 
So they were at lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So when you start actually looking at asking questions about how does this work among whites stratified by economic level, you sometimes get some pretty different answers. I mean, if people had looked, Diana Petiti had done it long before the hormone therapy work, the rates were crazy with rise, was that there was also, for example, a higher risk among people who use hormone therapy of dying in an airplane crash. That's a really big clue that there's socioeconomic confounding in the days preceding cheap airfare. So it's really important to think about these things because I would be really curious to know how different, cons different kinds of experiences among people who are white by virtue of what their childhood as well as adult economic circumstances were, what impact that has on immune function, just as I would be curious about the race, such economic stratification in any other group. And I will never take at face value a black-white comparison without thinking about people in their societal and historical context. And that's where critical thinking will get you in looking at health data and find, figuring out what's going on. Just to add to that, I think that um, just from a medical education standpoint, um, we allow um, our residents, our medical students, and even some of our clinicians to um, defer to um, default lazy thinking. Um, and we need to challenge that, uh, whether it's by literature or challenge them by uh, addressing the implicit bias that may be already present in those providers and helping them to understand that the, their laziness, their default thinking, uh, is having a huge impact on their patients. And if we challenge them uh, to think more about their patients and less uh, about what's going to move uh, that, that, uh, that, that clinic block quicker so they can get out on time uh, to get home to whatever they need to do and make them sit down and spend more time with their, their patients, I'm sure we would start to see uh, some, some, uh, address some of these uh, issues. So we'll go here and then here and then over here. Thank you for your time. I was just wondering if you could talk about the role that health literacy or the lack of health literacy would have on the systemic and structural racism and if there were areas in policy or research um, that you've seen advancement or um, some <coughs> suggestions. I mean, I, I can tell you based on the, the work that we've done actually, um, some of the things that we've done, again, in Southern California is looking actually the rates of cardiac rehabilitation on patients who have um, cardiovascular diseases, right? So we know it's a class one indication for patients who have a heart disease, an MI, heart failure, valvular surgery to undergo cardiac rehab. One of the things that we realize actually when you look at the statistics in the national level, um, about 60, maybe 50 to 60 percent of those eligible patients undergo cardiac rehab. Right, so there's about a 40% of population who are not getting it, right? But how does it actually look on when you actually stratify and look at race, ethnicity, language issues? So we actually looked at language, at least on our population. And one of the things that we find out, obviously, among those individuals who are non-English speakers, uh, are less likely to get cardiac rehab. And we're talking about abysmal rates. We're talking about about 10% who are not getting cardiac rehab. And that is because they don't have the resources available in the native language to actually understand what cardiac rehab is like and participate in the cardiac rehabilitation. So that's one example in which um, the lack of literacy, at least English speaking, and not able to communicate effectively can translate and not get any appropriate medical care that they need. Um, in my department, uh, Professor Rima Rudd is like a national expert on the qu kinds of questions that you focus on, so I'm not the right person to answer that question, but I would say that the amount of um, lack of literacy stratified by economic level is a real problem in terms of people who don't have access to good educations, and we know the problems that go on with public schools, and so that's, that's, it's a major issue about what people can really read and understand, let alone whether people are communicating clearly to them. So it is a big issue. I know there are initiatives underway, and that relates to the, all the concerns being said today, but that's not my area of focus, and one thing that I know is that when I'm speaking as an expert, I have to be really clear what I don't know. So my question, thank you both for your presentations. And my question is on the role of implicit biases because in, in some sense, um, this is the one provenance in which medicine is, is in a sense morally culpable because it's at the point of access to care if a doctor is displaying discriminatory behavior. It's not just a question of justice, actually it's a question of competence as well. Um, so, but 
in light of that, um, many of the interventions to directly target implicit biases are, they first of all, they haven't been tested uh, in very busy medical environments, but the interventions seem to last at most for about a few hours. So, um, which harks back to the issue of micro or macro level structural inequalities and how these lead to micro injustices. But I guess my question in light of that is, long term, should medicine be thinking about smart technologies as a way to bypass both the doctor and the patient? Well, patients may exhibit stereotype threat and so on too. So I guess long term, is this the direction of travel and should we be thinking about this more? So I'm happy to and jump in and start to answer. You know, no, I think that's a phenomenal question. And you know, the studies have shown, you know, when you include checklists into patient care, things are less likely to be missed, you're less likely to have um, bad outcomes for patients, less likely to have complications. Um, and with the implementation of EHR and having that added into um, uh, uh, patient care, those things just don't get missed. Did the patient get the aspirin? Are they up to date for their colonoscopy? Are they uh, getting their appropriate blood pressure checks? All of those sort of things don't get missed. And so when you're dealing with patients, we, we, uh, when, you, when, when you're dealing with uh, uh, providers, we often think, all right, we need to do more cultural competency education. We need to do more, more training. And what we're starting to see is you can train until the cows come home, and unfortunately, these things don't have as much of an impact as you would hope. But when you take it out of the doctor's hands, and when you take it out of the provider's hands, and these things happen automatically, you start to see a close in the gap of those health disparities. But I want to caution something, because I am quite aware of the drive for use of new technologies and data science and all the rest. But the problem is, is that there's an, a book that came out last year by Kathy O'Neill, you might be interested in Weapons of Math Destruction. And, um, and what's really important about that is that algorithms incorporate what's come before. So if what's come before is completely racially biased, guess what? And you have a lot of that in your criminal justice world in terms of the sentencing issues and taking things out of the hands of judges and going, great, let's just use automated biases instead. And so that's not so good because the other problem is that if you take only the past data, it doesn't tell you what can be in the future and it doesn't tell you what the other possibilities can be and it rules out those counterfactuals in many deep ways. So I think that there can't be an uncritical use of massive amounts of data because massive amounts of data are about how unfortunately inequal and unfair and unjust the current world is. So I don't think it's going to be just simply a technological solution that doesn't require grappling even with the people who are doing the coding and are coming up with the systems with their overt as well as implicit biases. And there's a fair amount of overt bias, by the way. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of it on display. And I was very glad, for example, in Boston that, you know, 40,000 people turned out against the 40 that came for the August 19th alt-right rally. But Still, there's a lot. And we've seen the rhetoric. I mean, I'm very glad that the, it seemed in the elections earlier this week that the most divisive inflammatory language was actually uh, punished in the, poll, in the votes. That's a very good thing. But it's a lot of work stuff out there. It's not just implicit. Yeah, so uh, I was just going to say that um, I, I think education is a huge component, but uh, the other piece of the, of the puzzle is actually um, going back to the community the group you're trying to help and actually try and find out um, what, what is the need and what is it they, that, they, that they require. Um, as it was mentioned, you know, you can't necessarily just look at the past and, and uh, just because it's worked before to a certain group of population, you can expect that it actually is going to work with another particular group. And that's um, particularly important as what we've seen here in, in uh, our patient population in California being so ethnically diverse. One particular strategy that we use for our Latino community Cannot, it will not necessarily work just as effectively to the African-American group. Um, again, because the needs are different. There's a language issue for one group, and for another group it may be different, it may be actually transportation. So geographic uh, barriers, it's all often an issue. So you actually have to look at the, the barriers that exist for each particular community to find out what solutions may be better. And technology doesn't necessarily always work since, um, again, a lot of the patient population, the vulnerable groups that we work with, are not necessarily don't have the technological uh, knowledge, the, the know-how to actually uh, implement some of those resources. We have a question here. Hi, thank you for talking with all of us. So I'm a first-year medical student, and we've 
as we've go gone through the curriculum, we've noticed that there's a lack of these conversations surrounding race, gender, how that affects outcomes, let alone racism or sexism and how that would affect health outcomes. And then have even received pushback on maybe race and gender don't need to be talked about in the classroom. So I'm just really curious about what you think the role of medical education is and like addressing these issues and like what does that look like because we're trying to get together say make these changes to the curriculum but we don't even know what the effective changes would be i mean i could tell you that uh, yes I, I got a lot of pushback when i was doing my research on um health disparities and social racism uh, among cardiothoracic surgeons and the patient population they were actually treating it was uh it became very controversial um it, again because um it, it basically showed um the, the, just the blatant uh, racism that occurred in terms of the treatment that they're actually being provided to the patient population and also the segregation in terms of where the providers, the, the cardiac surgeons were actually operating. So, uh, I mean, I received a, a lot of criticism by the, by the surgeons, you know, criticizing the work they were doing. Luckily, I had um, a, a very strong mentor um, that uh, helped me navigate the, those waters. Um, and it actually occurred in an institution like this one, you know, um, Dr. Ayanian, uh, uh, before he left, uh, again, uh, he was my mentor and helped me through this. And you're right, it, it, it doesn't get discussed in, um, in, in, in med school or in residency as often as you should, so that's why I, I jumped at the opportunity to actually come out here and, and, and be part of this panel. And I'm aware that there's um Lots of different people now starting to work on changing medical school curricula and different projects that are going on. I know there's a redesign in the midst of the works for the, one of the courses here at Harvard Medical School because I know I'm going to be talking at it in March. So, um, and, but I also know through the spirit of 1848 progressive pedagogy sessions, we've had a number of presentations by people who are working on changing medical school curricula and that there's active work in AMSA and a variety of other organizations. So you're not alone in feeling that concern and that absence. And this is what's wonderful is having people like you and others say, wait a minute, something is missing from our education. And then I come back to the point again that this is not about being quote unquote politically correct. It's because not knowing and not having these conversations leads to harmful practices and hurts people. And if you really take the oath seriously, you're not supposed to do that. And it's bad, unequivocally. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason. And the examples I was just giving before in response to the other construct was that if you, there, there are so many examples where if you don't ask these questions, you get the wrong answer and you do harmful things. So that's the reason to know this, because we aspire to having good information, good evidence, good knowledge, and we're supposed to be using our minds critically, not just shutting out things we're uncomfortable talking about. And what's not more interesting than figuring out all the ways in which living as a biological creature on this planet who's also socially engaged, how this all matters for our health? That's interesting, and it's hard to think about. It's a damn good challenge. So we have time for one last question. Um, we'll go to the back of the room. Short question, short responses from our uh, panelists so we can uh, wrap up this session. Okay, um, so I just had a question about funding. Um, so a big challenge in research is getting people excited about um, what your big question is. Um, and given kind of the statistics that you guys provided about the lack that there is um, in this type of research about racism and health, how do you get people excited about um, the type of work that you do? Uh, I mean, just briefly, just tell you, I'm, part of it is you have, to be, you have to be excited yourself, right? So you have to be, basically have that enthusiasm, and when a door closes on you, you need to knock on another door and try to open up the other door. So you basically have to be uh, resourceful, uh, show enthusiasm, um, be um, just uh, looking for, 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 uh, for opportunities. And luckily, like I said, with my mentors and uh, at the University of California, there's um, internal grants for, for this type of work, and I've been um, lucky to receive that type of support. And I would say that people pushing to make this kind of work be fundable is also part of the story. So it's not just one as the individual 
perky little scientist who's trying to get a grant, but it's thinking about the larger context. And so, for example, you're all fortunate to now be trying to look for funding at the time that the National Institute of Minority Health, Health and Health Disparities is an actual institute at NIH and can actually give out grants. It used to just be a center, in which case it was advisory, and it didn't actually have money in a portfolio in which to fund anything. So there's many people that have been pushing for many years to figure out the institutional vehicles that will make that possible, and to push on the funders so that it's not just, again, the perky little scientist or clinician that says, I have a great idea, but that there's actual work. And so there's been really, there's an interesting models to look at about what happened in Canada with um, the ways that they have set up a whole institute, the only one that actually focuses, for example, on gender and health. And what it took, and the advocacy building and years to get that become a central focus, to have an institute that funds it. So it's got to be the, looking at it in the larger context. And then I totally agree. You have to be really clear on why what you're doing matters and, that, and not to self-censor. Because there's a lot, I think, of some, it's not just that the funds aren't available, it's that people assume a priori you shouldn't try to ask these kinds of questions, and if you don't ask them, then they don't get asked, and then you don't get the answers. So it's also about how can answers make a demonstrable difference. So it's all of that, and I completely agree. I mean, you do this, and you get told no, and so then you go do something else, and you keep pushing. No is never an acceptable answer. Great. I want to say thank you to our panelists for um, <laughs> So I have a couple of announcements before we wrap up. Um, again, the conversation doesn't end here. There will be other uh, ESJ events taking uh, place throughout the year. Uh, be on the lookout. Check your email. Uh, those at our website. There are some handouts for some events that are happening more uh, approximately. Black Health Matters Conference at Harvard University. Uh, is hosting an open screening of unnatural causes when the bow breaks on November 10th. Um, is equity bad for our health at Trinity Church Sunday, November 12th? And then data for Black Lives Conference is November 17th through 19th. This is an inaugural conference at MIT. Again, other ESJ events are going to be happening. We talked about uh, uh, Dr. Shalala, who will be here uh, on November 14th. I want to say special thanks again to Attorney Rasan Hall. Uh, to Dr. Luis Castellanos and uh, Dr. Nancy Krieger uh, for your participation, and to our co-sponsors, the Commonwealth Fund Fun, uh, Mongan Fellowship in Minority Health Policy and the Harvard uh, School of Dental Medicine Office of Diversity and Inclusion. There are refreshments and drinks uh, outside, some snacks. Uh, please use this time to make connections, to mingle, to pass business cards, to collaborate, to think about ways that we can start to address uh, Racism, health disparities, equity, and social justice. Thank you for your time and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.